Um, every evening at 7 p.m., New Yorkers bang on pots and pans, clap and cheer to recognize and show appreciation to our city's essential workers who are on the front lines of the battle against COVID-19. Tonight is no exception. If you hear this, uh, it's Washington Heights. It's a party as well. Um, at any rate, that is what's going on outside the window right now. And these are the times that we're living through. Uh, as long as the crisis continues, uh, we hope to continue um, bringing you as well these talks online. Ideas, images, inspiration. So welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have photographer Tommy Ha as tonight's guest speaker. Originally from Memphis, Tennessee, Tommy is currently based in New York. He graduated with an MFA in photography from Yale University. Publications include Interview Magazine, Hyperallergic, Vice, Modern Painters, Slate, the Huffington Post, Butt Magazine, and Miranda July's We Think Alone. Recent group exhibitions, Launch F18, Ogden Museum of Southern Art, Aperture Foundation, Yong Kang Lu Art in Shanghai, Hier Festival in France, and Kunstverein Wolfsburg in Germany. Solo exhibitions have been held at Blue Sky Gallery in Portland and the Camera Club of New York, Tommy was a Hier Photography Grand Prize finalist, an Enfoco Photography Fellowship recipient, and a former artist in residence at the Center for Photography at Woodstock, Lightwork, Fountainhead, and at the Camera Club of New York. He's the author of the monograph, A Real Imitation, published by Ain't Bad in 2016. Please help me welcome Tommy Ha to our lecture series. Ooh, hello. <laughs> I'm gonna um, pretend that there's applause in the background. <laughs> uh, thank you all for joining me. Thank you, um, School of Visual Arts, for having me. Um, and, uh, everyone's uh, work into this. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen and then um, think out loud this process. So I'm going to start um, with a, a slight, uh, something new I, I started doing with my lectures and then um, I'll get right into my work. I traced my body back to Singapore, late 1800s, China, older country, and Vietnam, old country. The Treaty of Nanking established ports for the West, introducing the camera to China. The Chinese word for photograph is shying which can mean working with the shade. Celestials were mostly photographically absent in portraits made during the Transcontinental Railroad. By the 1920s, they arrived in the Mississippi Delta, or originally to work in the plantations and later becoming merchants and grocers. They were neither black or white, but were still subject to segregation. In the 1930s, my great grandparents fled to Vietnam from mainland China at the time of Japanese occupation and the civil wars but stayed during the fall of Saigon. During indoctrination, my mother had cleaned the landscape unaware of the hidden mines. She fled in 1983, eventually settling in Memphis. And that's how I came to be. I'm gonna start uh, showing um, work from my first monograph and then try to go back and forth in between um, what I'm working currently, I work on multiple concurrent projects at any given point throughout the year. I've mostly work in long form, uh, meaning I uh, revisit and add to uh, projects continuously. Um, so my first uh, body of work I started at Yale um, and culminated into this book a few years after I graduated called uh, A Real Imitation, which I joked about it being a group of pictures uh, pretending to be a body of work. Uh, but it really is something I like um, to show as like a Rosetta Stone to um, how um, my process is today. So a lot of the things I did then were really small snippets and were self-contained in singular pictures, um, but um, kind of informed a lot of, of the work 
as a whole together. Um, and a lot of the vernacular vocabulary um, kind of carried over. So the first picture I'm showing here is uh, a photograph I made of my mom and in, in, in me. And it's uh, uh, one of the earliest pictures I started doing um, as a collaboration with my mom. Um, this was a uh, uh, setup in uh, my child at home and in the front area of the room, the front house. Um, and my mom is holding the shutter cord. She's out of focus. I'm slightly out of focus as well. And then towards the front of the couch is the shutter, the end of the shutter cord. So it's actually not attached to uh, the camera itself. It's uh, the camera is on a self timer. So this whole picture was kind of tricking my mom into uh, making this picture that she wasn't being able to uh, actually take at the time. I started going back a lot to Memphis and I spit, I grew up um, the first 22 years of my life um, in Whitehaven, about two and a half miles away from Graceland um, in a neighborhood called Whitehaven. Uh, so I've never really uh, focused so much about uh, my own um, familial biography, but um, during a time of school, I was really curious in making pictures outside of um, what I came in with, with uh, this, these ideas of self-portraiture, which I quickly kind of grew uh, bored with. Um, I just, there's something about turning the camera to me and it not um, fulfilling a lot of the things I wanted it to do. So I started setting up um, these small moments or trying to find them, especially in the American South. And one of the pictures I set up was uh, in this Danish room, which in this back picture, that green shape in the background is the Danish chair being covered up. Um, this belonged to my grandfather, and that's his portrait, which you'll see again um, towards my recent um, project involving his image. And this is like the back room where he would secretly uh, perform um, uh, dentistry on certain clients and friends of the family. And it's something that he uh, was able to practice in Vietnam, but wasn't able to in the States when he immigrated in the early 1990s. My sister also pops up every once in a while. A lot of my family members kind of um, what I would describe as putting up with me uh, uh, with, well, they see my camera and then they're just like, oh crap. So they all either try to doll up or try to like avoid me the whole uh, family g gathering every time I'm home. It still continues um, as of last Christmas. That was me knocking over my computer, other computer. Um, and I don't know, they really uh, put up with me. Um, but in something that uh, carries through with my work is having, um, being allowed to um, direct um, friends and families, even strangers to uh, participate in these kinds of settings and um, that I just walk into. This coffee table we own, I have no idea how that calendar girl image um, entered that, um, this, my house at all. But I had my sister lie on top of it and kind of uh, echo the, uh, the image of the this really gorgeous, uh, beautiful model um, that's underneath this class. And a lot of uh, the things I was trying to explore with during grad school was uh, um, revisiting the use of having other people share the frame with me. So in a way to confuse this um, protagonism that comes with self-portrait work, uh, the artist um, presenting him or herself, uh, themselves in front, of the camera and it being like the so star. I was really interested in just subverting it in really small ways, just as simply inviting someone to share that that frame. Um, and this is one of my regular uh, sitters. I have a cast of people, I, not just my family members, but friends that I photograph over time. I think a lot of uh, uh, Sontag's, uh, Susan Sontag's quote of like photography is the inventory of, of our mortality. And what I was really doing with this work is trying to uh, reprocess a lot of techniques that were used in self-portrait genre. Um, uh, things of uh, meeting people off the internet, which don't recommend, uh, or Craigslist when it was, you know, a lot less sketchier um, back then. And 
um, insert myself in, into uh, these strangers' lives. And I mean, having to send these like questionnaires of like, uh, I try to make these portraits, but I don't really know where it's going, but I have this camera and let's just hang out and see. And I was really surprised with how many people were really open to this kind of uh, act, this kind of performance that is really echoed a lot through um, my collaborations with my mom and my regular cast. I worked with a lot of cutouts and some, um, things that I didn't own, but just walked into. Um, and this is something that was really just dumb, a dumb picture for me. And it was very simple of walking to a very changing, this bar that I really frequented um, in undergrad and it changing hands. And they started over producing this kind of nautical theme to very um, something close to camp. Um, and having this weird stand of like a male and masculine sailor next to a shirtless mermaid. mermaid. Another set of uh, regular casts. And I really wanted to think about the ideas of like self and other, um, Hegel, um, Sartre, and how um, we're really informed by um, other people's otherness. Um, and how we know more of ourselves through other people. I was also interested in um, photographing um, sites of preservation, things that um, in the South particularly to acknowledge the things, um, histories and events that occur. Because being born there and being from there and operating there still, it's a, I think um, it's, our responsibility, the photographer's responsibility to not ignore certain histories that are really just there. And even though I don't have an authority over um, people, other people's experiences that I would never um, um, experience myself, I think it, it is enough to acknowledge it in some part that this is a uh, part of my experience and not to uh, delete it from my own histories. Um, and this is the site of Martin Luther King's assassination. Is like the the former Lorraine Motel um, and now the uh, uh, Civil Rights Museum in Memphis. Um, another site of preservation, which I think is very photographic to me, is this. Uh, this is an Interior Sun Studio uh, where Elvis uh, Presley was discovered, and I really like the idea of these places that are just kept and using photographs to inform like what the place would have looked like when he entered or what the place looked like before. And I, I thought this kind of preserved site was is such a living photograph to me. Minus the pictures on the wall of Elvis, like that was definitely not there, but I love like when uh, not trying to hide the kind of artifice um, in these setups and like that reality or the present time kind of intrudes. Um, the cutout of Elvis is really important in my work, and this is not the one I use, but uh, I like showing this because of, uh, of his weird pop-up motif that just comes up frequently in my work. Um, I bought this Elvis off Amazon, and he said three lines, like exactly how much a, a guy has to say to me. Um, and I would use him as like a... Uh, uh, I, an object to pull focus. I was shooting between a digital camera and a four by five camera. And if this one through a view camera, um, I traveled uh, around a lot and working by myself a lot more frequently in school. So I needed something to uh, place focus on. So w oddly, uh, this cutout of Elvis was my stand in. Um, and there was a version of this picture where I would stand in physically for this other picture. Um, but Oftentimes I would pick the test pictures um, because I feel like that is closer to reality, this practice, this, uh, this true to real life experience. And plus I probably didn't look as flattering in the actual picture. The music interlude. Uh, 
Um, so I'm going to backtrack a little bit. So um, for a semester, I moved to uh, New York City uh, back in 2010 and participated in this artist residency called the New York Studio Residency Program and School of Visual Arts actually um, ho co-hosted us, uh, which was amazing. And the first time to ever experience New York outside of the imagery of uh, I Love Lucy and Law and Order, like those were the two things that uh, <laughs> Uh, that informed my practice uh, or informed my idea of New York. Um, and a lot of things were happening at that, uh, at that time that really uh, was a turning point for me. Um, it was the first time I, I turned the camera to myself more exclusively. And um, Tina, Tina Segal and Marina Abramovic were having these major shows at one of the Guggenheim and the artist, the president, at MoMA and I never seen performance art before and never really thought about photography and its relationship to it being performed. Um, so one of the earliest projects I did that I still continue, it's entering its 10th year um, as of this year, um, it's called Return to Sender and, and the rules have been the same uh, for the last 10 years, it's uh, people can kiss me however way they want to. It has to be on the lips and it has to be at night. Um, and I would just carry my camera and tripod around or tie the camera to something that would sturdy it and make these really clumsy um, uh, pictures, really something I didn't want to think about the composition so much uh, to be closer to snapshot aesthetic. Like I was seeing Nan Golden's photographs for the first time in person um, instead of in a projection and just being able to see it, all these pictures I studied um, really was so profound for me and the reason why I did it at night was uh, I thought it was more romantic and highlighted the, the gesture of the kiss um, and one of the technical aspects of it was the the exposures were really long like they were low iso um the shutter speeds like open i think the longest was a two second exposure i feel like that number keeps changing every time i think about it but um it just creates this big tension of us the kisser and myself um having to hold our pose um, first, I enlisted uh, friends of friends, studio mates, pe strangers of um, people I just met off the street um, or at parties or events and just asked them to participate in this um, performance piece. And it wasn't until I collected like the first set of 15 um, that I really, th these secondary gestures emerge and how differently people kiss me. I had an idea of what the kiss would be. A kiss on the lips is very like can be conjured in the, the mind's eye. Um, but across the board, just strangers, people who I didn't know really well, friends, um, ex-lovers just are participate, did the act so um, differently and they approach it differently. Um, and there's no direction other than the, the three rules. And so people who would literally physically pick me, my body up, um, was a surprise that wasn't directed. Um, and trying to like hold that pose in a very really sh short, uh, time span and a long exposure is just like, uh, trying not to laugh and all these things trying to, uh, not break the reality of the photograph. And then thinking about it more um, over the years is continuing this this project for me was something um, that I knew how to do quite well, but it was something unsettled for me to uh, just stop at 15, stop at 20 pictures, and I kept going. And I just wanted to collect and grow this project um, more. Surveying different um, places, um, Usually like, I, I carry the camera with me wherever I go and I travel for work. I go back home frequently and can just make these uh, exposures, this performance in a short time frame. And that's also like my first digital um, pictures. This is a straightforward uh, uh, digital um, and trying to experiment with uh, 
ways that can um, take advantage of this technology. And it was really something I tried to not um, be shoot happy to like make multiple frames of, but treat it like a film camera to uh, go back and forth and readjust myself, slightly readjust the, uh, my collaborator. And one of the things I, I, I noticed is, uh, that I think is probably the truest co collaboration I've had. The kisser gets to pick and portray however they their what their image would result in. And at the same time, I was creating this uh, deadpan character that um, was denying this very romantic and at times aggressive uh, act. And I just very profound still just looking at these pictures and trying to uh, what can I do next what can I do differently and over time the cameras have changed I think it started with a Nikon to a Canon and now it's like shot on a Pentax that's crazy and I don't use any um, external lights or anything because mostly I just don't think I'm really good at it uh, but I th there's something about the long exposures that really accentuate the kind of colors and even the performance itself. And it's something I didn't really think about, but I started consciously thinking of it more uh, about two years ago in Memphis and how um, how much it is safer to do it and uh, to do this uh, project in New York and California. But operating in the South is really like trying to be careful of what of people who are also sharing the same public space. Um, if they walk in on this uh, um, act, it's, uh, I'm not sure how they would react. So a lot of these places are really uh, familiar and has this really strong ambient light that I, I want to photograph in, but there's also like a lot of caution that goes into it still. Hotel pictures are always the best. I think it's a, about to be a really big cliche in my work, uh, but I just love hotel pictures. <laughs> Then you get the idea of that one. And um, I presented these in my uh, in a solo show last year for the fr uh, first time. I've like did small group shows where I, um, in the background of this um, slide, you see um, these postcard printed size, drugstore print size, four by sixes mounted on the wall back there. And um, one of the things I started to experiment more is like a uh, form and presentation. And I found a play, a lab out in the Midwest at, that um, would duplicate my digital slides onto uh, printed on film, which I really liked the idea. It was the same process of um, film studios, um, shooting on films, getting a digital digitized and then editing it, that video and then sending it back to be printed back on film stock. Um, and I really love like the idea of a slideshow. I just had to turn on the lamp next to me because it's getting dark in here. Um, and as something I'm really like wanting to return back to that name, that slight Nan Golden influence at the beginning. Um, and also the possibilities of this second life, this afterlife of a photograph. There's the photograph and then there's the printed form and what I could do with the printed form. And the other thing I could do was um, uh, uh, print them on vinyl and then fold them against the gallery space. Um, I think the next one is a closer up. Yes. And part of why I decided to make uh, the majority of the prints uh, four by six, um, I don't have the other slide in here, but uh, one of the things I noticed early on is that um, printing them small, a lot of uh, viewers would approach the picture and kind of like lean in and, and look at the picture a lot closer. And it was kind of imitating like going in for the kiss. And I really like that weird unintended um, uh, form um, uh, viewing of these images, just re the repetition of the kiss um, continues. Um, and this is like a quick video of like this, this um, I would say parallel universe project. Um, on top of like traveling, I 
um, and probably my love of hotel rooms as uh, photographing beds I slept in. And I do these exercises for myself. I'm like how to present or make self-portrait work that doesn't necessarily involve my body at all. And part of this, uh, uh, this project uh, was the act of sleeping and then waking up and making a picture of where I slept in. Um, oftentimes there's uh, the tr uh, uh, my presence is traced by the, the beds themselves being slept in or the presence of my shadow or some form of my body in there or someone that's in the sharing the hotel room with me. I read some things because I keep forgetting to read these notes. Um, a palindrome is a word or pattern that instead of developing in different directions, it folds in on itself so that the beginning and the end mirror each other, that they are the same. No matter what we do to ourselves, we're the same people as we were born as. And that's from Todd Salons. Mimicry in nature was first observed in butterflies in the 19th century. Certain breeds pose as wasps, other bear marks falsely advertising that they are poisonous. Haru Segal, Segal um, on Cindy Sherman for the New York Times. The monarchs that fly south will not make it back north. Each departure then is final. Only their children return. Only the future revisits the past. Ocean Vuong on Earth were briefly gorgeous. So, and now we're kind of entering the last um, um, more recent body of work uh, that I started, um, I would say relatively about 2015 and it's also a long form. Um, I started experimenting more about uh, these cutout images. And so I want to go back and say like, I don't Photoshop any of my work. I just do color grading and, and cropping. And that's like the extent of it. Um, but a lot of the work I do is in camera um, and um, doing this kind of setup and performance in for, for the camera. Um, th this is a shot in a prop house in Miami when I was on residency. And it's like with my cardboard cutout image, um, that was one of the forms it took with uh, thinking about cutouts and also being a little bit tired of photographing myself physically, like going back and forth, it was just really tiresome. Um, so I decided to um, make, uh, fa fabricate these uh, cutouts of myself in different forms um, for this larger body of work called facades. Um, and this is uh, one of the pieces, uh, another form is a puzzle set. So I would make uh, pictures of myself and have it sent off and fabricated to this puzzle piece and then photographing it um, again on a flat surface. A 3D printed mask of my face. So like, uh, it's pretty much the same process of having, going from my archive um, of self portraits that I just don't use and having having to send them out to third party companies um, to fabricate this image. So I thought it was like a really nice, like photographic rhythm, photographic um, process for me. Um, so the resulting non-printed format is this uh, puzzle set cut out, uh, cardboard cut out or this uh, mask of my face, all done in the same like process. And I thought it, was, it really uh, worked well together. Um, the masks particularly are worn by uh, queer bodies, um, southern body uh, people from the south and um, um, Asian bodies. Um, originally, I think I was trying to uh, make myself more queer, more Asian um, by putting my face on it. And another antidote was trying to ruin nude photography by putting my face on it. So. Uh, but it became a nice uh, prop and object of trying to travel through uh, across the country with a, a mask of my face and my my check my my carry on uh, TSA is just like not like figure not knowing what the hell it is at times. So it's really fun to uh, go through the airport with uh, these just like in my um, luggage. Um, and then there was also signal a return of like focusing um, and making more photographs of my mom. And I love like the, how the mask can function as both a self portrait as and a still life. Um, and this is another like lazy, more of a lazy example of not using Photoshop and instead of using masking tape to uh, tape my face on a bus um, at my job. <laughs> so, you know, do it on your break, like got to make pictures somehow. Uh, but I love the idea of combining both a classical uh, way of making sculpture through molds and plat uh, molds and 
uh, marble and sculpting to something more uh, modern now, uh, this 3D printing technique where you can either send a picture or get scanned. Uh, this is an example of just after a session and just not like liking the pictures I made and then, then looking up and then seeing uh, these stack of mirrors in my friend's studio and just like have, he was already in this kind of similar position. And then uh, it's like, hey, can you just bend over a little bit and just hold the face a little bit? Cause it looks like you're, I'm fucking myself. Uh, I just uh, really kind of try to be continuous, continuing that uh, humor um, that I was kind of missing um, from my kissing pictures. And at times I would, uh, would uh, confuse like the idea of authorship. So if having to stand in front of the camera and does it necessarily, if I'm, even if I'm not actually uh, hitting the, the shutter button myself, like am I really the author of my own work? It is my ideas, my concept, and also like my body being, um, being a, a marker for this work. And now um, the shutter cord is played a really important prop as an extension of my body, not just my shadow or a limb of mine or my image. And this picture here is made with my friend Duran and we posed for each other's work that day. Um, I'm giving Duran like the control of the shutter while I'm actually holding the camera itself. Um, this is, uh, some of the cardboard have white backing. So the, uh, some are made out of foam card, foam core or regular cardboard. Um, I think this was actually a trace of one of the cutouts. And I, I just, wanted to make a picture where it looks like I cut myself out of uh, the image. Also, I'm really interested in just making like shitty looking Photoshop pictures without using Photoshop. So, and experimenting with different materials as well. With the mask, it changes a lot more. Um, this one's like the only fabric um, use uh, fabric material that I use and like yielded a, a more interesting picture. Um, and Oddly, it was uh, more successful photographing it in Hollywood um, at my friend's place uh, in La LA, really, Echo Park. And then just like returning, um, I think eventually I started exploring more with the idea of the paper mask. It was something I, I actually started first, but didn't like a lot of the results of it. And it made a lot of sense to combine the flatness of the cardboard cutout with the uh, the, 3D printed mask and it's still the mask, but now it's like more marrying the two worlds together. And then I got quickly bored and threw my face away. So that's a, that's a, a picture of that. And so now like uh, more of what I've been working on recently is experimenting with temporary tattoos. Um, so I've been fabricating these limbs, these cut up pictures um, into different, uh, from different parts of my body. And so this is um, uh, my eyes underneath my actual eyes in camera. Um, this is actually um, around a time where my friend just had a seizure and it turned out he had a tumor. So uh, it was my whole uh, reaction to everything that was going on in my life. And kind of like the mask itself, it's uh, it does uh, blind people. Uh, there's no eye holes in these masks, so um, the way that the sitters I I cast end up having to uh, have so much vulnerability to me just by simply like not being able to see what's going on. Um, so this is a installation of what the work uh, looks like. This is a presentation of my work last year at the Hier Festival in the south of France. It's one of my like favorite uh, festivals that I've just been to. I met so many incredible photographers um, and designers and uh, fashion designers. And I just love, I, I, they were so kind of, uh, especially making a really crappy Google SketchUp at the bottom here, and then um, translating it very well for the presentation of it. They even built me a wall, they're so great. Um, I was just really, and I like the folding really came out of this. Um, also, uh, a lovely idea of like stacking on um, using my own work to stack and decorate um, my existing photographs, uh, and just this idea of like a soft collage of putting my own work on top of each other. Um, 
And then this is uh, something that just happened in February in LA um, before this whole thing came down. So uh, LA uh, through the Billboard Creative of uh, having, um, being able to show my work in Los Angeles for the first time. So it's amazing to just see this uh, second life uh, of where the work can end up. And then um, returning back into the cutouts as of recently and trying to play around with the material a bit more, like it, it really parallels with the idea uh, of pulling stuff from my own biography and trying to uh, work with the material that I have. So similar to the roles with like the kissing pictures being the same, I w wanted to look at what I was using, what I'm using and trying to uh, pull more things that, um, that can speak about uh, the experiences I have, especially having to make uh, answer to my conflicting narratives of being queer and being Chinese, Vietnamese, and uh, from the American South. And not having that kind of representation around me. Also, I want to point out that I don't, I, I made black and white, but I'm really much of a color photographer. Um, I just love color so much and just uh, blocked out with having um, been in places and come, being able to come back to places that uh, I've traveled to and make something and, you know, not get, you know, arrested by the TSA for having weird stuff, you know, my thing. Um, and, you know, this is a, um, the, a smaller version of the mask um, display for, at the Camera Club show last year. Um, it just, uh, it was a less interesting forward and then we decided to, to just flip it backwards to see the inside of it and just this weird non-printed photograph. And then return in trying to emulate a traditional sculpture as well, but still the kind of photographic um, process echoed with me with um, uh, these impressions of the, the, the molding onto my body and then making this uh, myself as a negative and then the resulting sculpture as like a addition of a print of that. Hair went really well, so. And then enlisting um, other studios to help um, uh, create um, unique objects. So where I was talking about um, replication of my form in, um, in the cloning, in a way of cloning, um, I wanted to make uh, photographic prints that were unique that weren't easily um, copied. So the only way to really see these um, images are in person um, as itself. This is a Polaroid done through the Holographics studio that, um, that photographs your aura with this uh, $10,000 camera. And they, like, I finally found a, a camera operator, a photographer to uh, uh, amuse me with uh, holding my um, face up. So the magic jewelry in Chinatown did not like my face. Sits. Faces, they did not like my faces. And this is like a example of like the jigsaw. I don't really like to make pictures over and over again. Um, I think once I've done it, I wanna explore other ways to mess with the, the form itself and the material materiality. Um, so this is a two puzzle set. Um, taking the photographs are made a year apart from each other, but uh, my mom's image came first and then it's the second picture a year later was me um, in a very similar composition setting and just where our bodies met in the image. I alternated our, uh, our puzzle pieces with each other and I'm really upset of how um, similar I look like my mom. So uh, yeah, so uh, I have a lot to talk, think about in therapy. Um, and this is a uh, tin type done through the Penumbra Foundation. So they're a really great resource and saw this uh, mask. Um, I probably broke this mask afterwards because I'm very clumsy. So it's probably why I don't make a lot of these masks or these objects because I keep breaking them. And exploring um, the ideas of death. That's something that's very uh, comes forward through uh, that's been coming back into my work um, and its relationship to the South and how it's manifested as a symbol. And then this la I think one of the last pictures for the uh, installation. Um, and something I did in court uh, while I was self isolating a week ago is just 
uh, I had all this stuff made um, before I was going to go on spring break back to Memphis, and now I'm stuck in, at, in my apartment in Brooklyn. So uh, this was done um, in isolation. So uh, it's a, what my a scan, uh, the photo backdrops made from uh, this scrambled visualization of my image when the uh, LaGuardia Print Studio scanned my face to make a new 3D printed mask that's a lot more accurate um, than rendering it from pictures. And this visual, visual, visualization was uh, acts as a kind of palette um, to dictate the colors for the printing. And another, uh, this is um, an image from I Shot in the South and that is, was made into a backdrop and then my cutout where the face fell out of it and I just um, tried to make something in the middle of isolation. So I hope everyone um, is having fun um, in the middle of wherever they are. But I, I really wanted to emphasize a lot of the cutout um, and how it presents itself um, throughout my other work. So at the same time making the cutouts, um, I started to do another exercise of uh, revisiting themes of representation and image and depiction. And since I grew up uh, close to Graceland, um, I made a visit and paid $25 to this really um, Photoshop 3. I don't think it was called CS3. Um, the gift shop workers would make this really, really crappy uh, green screen uh, of you with Elvis in the room. And they somehow like, gave me the file. I like sweet talked him to giving me the file. And uh, yeah, Elvis is not in this picture, y'all. Like even one of the pool balls is fake. It's not this, none of this is real. I feel like I'm gonna be saying that for a while. <laughs> but the exercise I wanted to do was to um, not make photographs of myself, but to explore this I, those ideas and um, of image and especially Elvis image um, and thinking that legally is like um, his estate owns his image so I'm not technically allowed to use his his image in um, without their permission so uh, unless you uh, transform it in some way um, as a, another work of art um, but I was really interested in photographing um, Elvis impersonators um, and the political correct term is Elvis tribute artist so never call an Elvis tribute artist an Elvis impersonator because um, they will tell you and correct you. Um, but I love the, the sculpting. I love like the uh, the wigs and the makeup. The not only are they imitating his singing voice, um, his dance movements, his body movements, his like um, talking voice itself. There's this performance of Elvis that I was really drawn to, um, and I thought really w related a, uh, a lot to what I was doing. Um, and this is uh, Robert Washington. He's known as Black Elvis. I love he's like wearing an, a shirt of Elvis and he stands in front of uh, W.C. Handy, uh, the father of the blues and this like really one shack house behind the theater that a lot of them, uh, these ETAs would perform at. It's just amazing and how <laughs> uh, they transform their bodies. And there's uh, definitely a older generation and a younger generation um, coming back. And this is something, uh, a body of work that I only do like once a year. Um, the deaf anniversary is in August. And so all, all these people from Australia, Wales, Japan would just come in and commemorate Elvis. Um, and within this body of work is this uh, body within a body of work. Um, this is my friend's son, Cooper, and he's been grooming himself to be in, um, an ETA over the last um, four years, would be five years this August. And so what you'll see is him, um, this was the most recent, um, 2018, 2017, 2016, same kid. Um, and then I just also, uh, my love of um, getting two Elvis, Elvi, he's not Latin, Elvis is uh, together in one picture. It's like Jesus met God. And it also allowed me to come back into this um, to the uh, south and and instead of making these self portraits, um, explore the American landscape a bit more. Um, something that I just I've always wanted but never felt like I had the right to, even though I was born in in Memphis. And so much of it is like haunted by this 
this image of him and how like he manifests so much. And this is me performing as, uh, um, uh, well, it's not a true impersonation. It's more like uh, me as Andy Coppin as Elvis minus the singing is the official uh, performance persona. Um, and it's just me reading. So I'm a singer song reader. <laughs> and then somehow I ended up <sighs> just in this body of work somehow. And I think that's the inescapable, inescapable nature of the this work I'm trying to explore, especially with the South. Uh, let's see. I think a Deanna Arvis quote would be great. Let's see what's next, actually. Oh, and more pictures. And then in the last section. So uh, Deanna Arvis and what she wrote for her Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship. I want to photograph the considerable ceremonies of our present because we tend while living here and now to perceive only what is random and barren and formless about it. While we regret that the present is not like the past and despair of its ever becoming the future, its innumerable, inscrutable habits lie in wait for their meaning. I want to gather them like somebody's grandmother putting up preserves because they will have them, because they will have been so beautiful. Um, so the last section of this is uh, something that's kind of still ongoing. I'm trying to figure out um, while in isolation uh, with uh, photographs of uh, continued collaboration with my mom. Um, and it's part of a larger body of work. And it's comprised of like um, pictures that she made. She gifted me a photo album that she made a year after she fled Vietnam. And it was just titled Canada 1984. That was it. Um, in these pictures, I reappropriated um, her work against the work of our collaboration. And it starts, the first page was actually a pasted picture of my grandfather. And this is an image that is recycled, uh, meaning it's used in our family shrine, it's used in his passport picture, and it's used in his tombstone. I like describing like my mom's pictures as half cell portraits because they share half my DNA with her. And so inevitably photographing my grandmother, um, she's my only grandparent left uh, as this kind of quarter, half, uh, quarter cell portraits. The back of my mom's head and just having this, these moments of collaboration, it's a really neutral, way of sharing experiences where originally she was someone I photographed as this antagonist into now someone that is someone that resembles my mom in some way and then thinking about um her own trauma of indoctrination camps and fleeing and being on a boat for nine months her work is really odd I just it's very everyday, very celebratory, and very of uh, things typical in a family album. So I want our pictures to be something that's not so typical. A lot of her uh, pictures of her, which I call cell portraits just because of the composition is just so wacky. Like it has to be on a tripod somehow. It's, uh, I, just, I, I just don't believe there was another photographer making these pictures of her. Also, she's behind a lot of plants. Just, I don't know, like right here is just behind a plant. I, I don't know why. She was stuck in a tree in one. In the 1980s and uh, mid 1980s in London, Ontario, where the majority of these pictures were made. Items just like kept on shelves, what's displayed, what's filed away at the bottom part of the shelf, what's weighed, what is preserved sites become these objects of birds, plants that grow. Also, why would you keep a picture of a crying person? I just, there is something very, art, art, very artistic about it. I feel like my neighbors are having a party. And then the last section of this part ends here. And it comes to um, what is supposed to be a forthcoming book of uh, kind of like a, a first collection of soft murders. Um, 
and it comes with uh, this news article citing um, uh, re recalling the last sighting of my aunt before she was murdered. And then last year, I've realized I could request an autopsy report, and uh, they found it and sent it to me. And something I haven't read yet. And so the I, idea now um, is to have um, actresses to read for me uh, these scientific things um, that's written of her body. And it'll be my first time hearing it and actually like learning more about what the uh, what really happened, except I know the story. Kind of like boyhood, but womanhood. <laughs> and a lot of these pictures end up being borrowed by other bodies of work, by other projects. So what appears in one um, can be uh, can reappear in another. That's my work, so. I feel like I should probably say. Whenever I'm asked why Southern writers particularly have a penchant for writing about freaks, I say it is because we are still able to recognize one. To be able to recognize a freak, you have to have some conception of the whole man. And in the South, the general conception of man is still in the main theological. I think it's safe to say that while the South is hardly Christ-centered, it is most certainly Christ-haunted. The Southerner who isn't convinced of it is very much afraid that he may have been fat formed in the image and likeness of God. Ghosts can be very fierce and instructive. They cast strange shadows, particularly in our literature. In any case, it is when the freak can be sensed as a figure for our essential displacement that he attains some death. And, and some teas, uh, which we can go through, but uh, it ends with uh, other uh, pictures happening in the South of uh, my travels in Alabama, um, editorial commission works. There's the image for the backdrop. And then photographing, uh, and then uh, right now I'm uh, photographing the Mississippi Delta Chinese group community um, that's been there since the 1920s. And they have an amazing archive at Delta University of their time there. Uh, from a population of 300, thousand I want to say to well, maybe 30,000 um, to I think under 300 now and continuously uh, uh, trying to photograph the American southern landscape and the queer figures and the um, that inhabit it as well so as uh, all these things part of this strange family album and then just signs it's really just signs in the last part of this. And then there's like some guy pictures, but we don't have to talk about those. So yay. Um, yay. I think that's it. Um, I think I, I'm going to stop sharing this soon. It, the screen, but I don't know where my mouse is. So this is going to be really blind clicking for a second. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much, Tommy. What a great uh, and, you know, far ranging, you know, exploration of projects. Uh, we have time for a brief Q&A, everybody. So if you want to start sending some questions Tommy's way, uh, do so via the chat on your bottom screen. Um, Tommy, why don't I start you off um, with with a couple of things until people join in? Yeah. Um, I um, I noticed that one of the recurrent themes in in your practice is a kind of being there and not being there simultaneously. I don't know how else to put it, but it, as let's say, take for for instance, return to sender, where it seems like you're often reluctant or unwilling to be kissed. Um, 
and and I and I feel that in some of your other work as well, where you're asserting yourself but withdrawing at the same time, or or you know replacing yourself with um, with an imitation of yourself, uh, a substitute, if you will. And where does this impulse come from? Can you talk more about the origins of that? Yeah, um, honestly, I wasn't so conscious of my role or at least my photographic self, the self that's photographed and pictured. Um, I also never really thought of it being something close to the accuracy of my myself. I think um, I was trying to use photography as a way to arrive at my own representation, um, to arrive at my um, image. And at, at things that you kind of see earlier with the, especially with the video of the Titanic scene, uh, where the uh, my collaborator was actually drawing that and he drew me as Elvis, uh, Drew is uh, an indicative word. But I think it's very telling of how much I grew up in uh, from experience in the South where there wasn't people that looked like me. Um, even though there was like a, 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 a small population, I never knew about the Mississippi Delta Chinese group until very quite recently. And the only people that looked like me were, happened to be my family members. And I went to an all black school for grade school. And it was just in things on TV, I just never what felt reflected. And I think it came through um, in this deadpan character and the kissing pictures, the Law and Order video piece where you just never see me. And it's something I wasn't as conscious, but over time end up um, trying to manifest that as its own character. Because um, I think that is something very felt for people of color and queer people, queer people of color especially, um, that is a, a, a larger shared experience that um, I don't think it gets articulated a lot in photographically. Um, there's a me appearing in the camera, in the camera, but I don't know how much of it is actually me. Um, like you see those credits in some movies where the actor is actually play, is either credited as himself or as that actor's name. And so I think that's like a really, I, I think that's a really good analogy. So. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I have a few questions here. Uh, first off from Hannah Stapleman. Uh, she says, can you explain the other that you mentioned earlier in the lecture? The yeah. other in quotation marks. Um, I, you know, I think um, otherness, I, I think starting with it, um, with uh, something with Return to Sender, I would say that's my earliest uh, project I ever started with. And it's something otherness with being other was something I didn't consider or thought about consciously. And over time, um, what, I was doing and learning that kind of language in the reading um, academic, academic about that. Um, it just kind of made sense and starting to allow me to articulate what more what I was seeing. Simply, it was just kind of having fun fucking around and like making these like funny pictures. But um, what I was trying to say um, then had made so much sense. Like in Hollywood, no one was craving for Asian male actors in representation. We just got crazy rich Asians. Unfortunately, it's a rom-com um, and those kinds of narratives, um, but no one was demanding that. Um, there was Fresh Off the Boat, like just ended its uh, season run. And that was something weirdly important um, for me to watch recently and outside of graduate school. But you know, things that were in it being thrown at me were girls or narratives that like I should appear somewhere or some someone that looks like me. Um, and I think other, feeling other and the same, is it, feeling other in the self is just one and the same. We, those things really inform one another. And I don't mean to make it sound binary or making it sound like you can't have one without the other, but there's something to be said about um, uh, what I was doing with sharing the frame. Like we're best, uh, being defined by our moments, but also through other people's like differences. Um, let me continue down the line. Uh, here is Isabella Matute. 
uh, by the way, if I mispronounce anybody's name, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm doing my best. Um, how are you going to deal with uh, hotel rooms in isolation? Does your bed get photographed daily now? It's weird. I don't photograph my own bed. I, it's it looks okay. I just got a new mattress, but um, the light just is, hasn't hit it in a way. And then a lot of my friends' artworks is on the wall, so I just uh, I feel like it's too distracting for a picture. But I'm hoping um, soon uh, I'll be able to like photograph it again. Um, but uh, the for some reason, like my personal bedroom bed, like is not. Um, part of the that body of work um but ha i'm hoping i'll travel more there's some things like lined up um down the line this year so i'm not too worried about it i've accumulated like enough to say like here's um here's here's this here, here are these pictures so i was um i was also curious to ask you all in all how long have you been collaborating with your mom um i would say before having the the photo album, I would I think the picture we made was 2011. Okay. I've never photographed her before then. Okay, so um, during that interval of time, during those nine years, um, has her um, attitude changed in any way? Has she, you know? how does she feel when she goes to an exhibition and sees these works in the wall? Can you talk more about it from her point of view? She, I would, I, I've been describing it as a disinterest. Um, she's a, 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 an immigrant, a refugee. So I, there, my mom and aunts and uncles have a different relationship to photography that, um, that I am way more entitled and privileged to, um, to, uh, I'm, um, to have with photography now. Um, so before, for them, it's really reserved for like family gatherings, celebratory birthdays. Um, no one photographs at funerals. No one um, photographs, uh, I don't know, like things outside of birthdays. It's just a lot of birthday uh, pictures, I would say. Um, I remember seeing a picture of them gambling, and I remember seeing a photograph of them um, uh, cooking, uh, which all these are very communal, familial activities that I'm, I, I grew up um, um, seeing. Um, but right now, I when we started, it was very really hard to get her to pose um, and to not smile. Uh, and over time, it became something very ritualistic. And for for us, like when I'm in town, like she um, um, pick a date that's like, oh, I'm available these mornings and like come over, I'll make you lunch, but you can eat after we shoot. Um, just let me know what I can dress up as. And it's very, um, uh, what's the, um, sterile doc going to the doctors it's very uh, <laughs> very formal and nothing else and she has seen my work before but not in a way that is so intimate um, um, for example she doesn't know I'm queer uh, it's very it's like that part of my identity is really much hidden because I'm from a family that we just don't talk about those things um, and that's kind of uh, part of my own self-preservation as well. So there's these things I'm trying to find out from her and find out about myself while trying to photograph her. And I think in some way she understands um, these moments of picture making between us is that it is somehow important, but um, she doesn't have um, that kind of um, way of questioning it or uh, understanding it on a deeper artistic level. And for her, it's more memorable as um, recalling um, gatherings and happier times than these weird, uh, I'm on the ground, um, what is happening? Um, uh, there is another question here and I don't wanna hog the, the, the time that we have. So I'm gonna leave it at that, but I, I do have a lot more things to ask you regarding that. Um, uh, it's from David. Uh, hey, Tommy, big, big fan. I'm currently a photography major and I've been working on self-portraiture, which led me to find your work. Can you share how this self-experimentation or using of your body has affected your own perception of yourself? Um, I think photography inherently is staged in some way. 
Um, and I think by now we're at a point where photography is so much part of our culture and it's a language. It is not just a visual language, it's a language. Like people can talk in pictures. I think that's part of the staying power instead of Twitter and Facebook that Instagram has such a uh, staying power with people. Um, and with how it affected me, I, I hate taking pictures of myself, <laughs> honestly. I, um, it's, it's, it's very laborious, it's very indulgent. You know, you can't deny like having uh, a an invention that's like not in readily in the hands of everybody, but people who uh, can are in school or are well off or has an access to a camera. It's very entitled um, place to be, and I think um, to loop back um, at my opening sentences. Um, because photography and the camera has been embedded in our culture for so long, like people act so differently, like consciously and, sub and unconsciously, subconsciously. Um, we adjust ourselves when the camera's pointed to us. We know we like what to do, how to adjust ourselves. Um, and at some points, like the better light, there's a lamp next to me that's being um, green screen out of this. So, um, for example, um, to have the camera at a higher angle. Um, and it does, I believe, um, even in some ways with street photography that it's, it is staged. There's something framed out, composed out. And I think that no matter how close we get to a real life authenticity, uh, a real life experience photograph, like there's something staged or set up about it. Um, and that's something that has affected me. Like I've uh, having a camera on my phone and just like, oh God, my hair. Even like trying to fix my hair right now. This is why I wear the hat too. Um, here's another question from Darylland Saunders. I'm trying to hide. In return, <laughs> I'm trying to hide the can. We all see the can of beer. Feel free. Uh, you are at home. In return to sender, to try to have some, I'm sorry, did you try to have the same number of female versus male, or that didn't matter, thank you. Uh, no, um, it was mostly trying to get uh, people I didn't know quite well. So it started off with strangers and quickly it went into uh, friends of friends. And now it's like um, casting models and actors um, to play a part of it to see if it really um, messes with the rules that are set up for um, the project. Yeah, I was I'm never conscious about um, trying to get more women or more men, but more, um, in the last uh, five years with the increase of, of demand of diversity for in, um, in narratives, um, I think has uh, infor influenced me to like seek out people that are just like, not like my usual set, set, um, set of setters. So, and I think I feel like really kind of guilty with um, having so, com being so comfortable with um, people I see, uh, on the street every day and now i'm like really like oh wow now i'm chasing after like uh, just all all kinds of people like i it's been more trying to do uh include everyone as much as i can um yeah as, as long as we're on the subject of return to sender um i can't resist asking you how many kisses how many takes until you feel like you have the image uh, <laughs> um, so when I started out, I think I would take about 10 to 15 frames. Um, I wish I did more because then I would make a, like a really cool stop motion thing, but I wasn't really clever back then. <laughs> and now it's, uh, um, I have a, a self timer. I used to have, um, uh, a third person, um, a friend of a studio mate would help, um, click the shutter for me. Um, and then I moved to doing self timer for 10 seconds and then having to hold that and then trying to time it right with the person who's not very used to a self timer and they move and we have to do it again. So, um, now I'm working with a, a remote and that's, oh God, that's just, it made everything so much quicker. Um, now I just like down to two, three frames and it's just a, something like, um, I, I think it comes with like paying attention to lighting and like how, um, um, where I want the camera set up and then knowing like the technical aspects and then trying to make sure like the kisser holds still. Um, 
that's all the time we, we have for the Q&A. I want to say thank you to everybody in our audience for joining us tonight on this, you know, first Zoom i3 lecture. And uh, Tommy, thanks so much for a stellar lecture. We really enjoyed having you. And there's so much inspiration here for us. Thank you all.